Good morning, Hillsboro Presbyterian Church. How is everyone this St. Patrick's Day morning? Good morning. Um, I was had a conference this week in Louisiana, and um, for actually, I flew out Sunday night, came back Wednesday night. I was supposed to come back Thursday, but there was a snowstorm at my connecting flight on a Thursday, so I got to come home early. And I cannot tell you how excited I was to come home because Louisiana was not my favorite place to be at a conference, but always especially exciting to be back with you. Um, I feel like God has given me a deep love for this church family, so it's good to be with you all. I um, want to fill you in on a few announcements. Some of you may have seen, I'll start with our Holy Week activities. So we have printed up a flyer that just captures all of the things that are happening at HPC for Holy Week. So starting with Palm Sunday, um, and it's in the back. So we didn't give one to everybody because not everybody wants to put this up on their refrigerator. But if you do, if you're somebody who you kind of need that visual reminder, that is there for you. Um, but Palm Sunday, we invite you to help us decorate the sanctuary by bringing in an Easter lily. So if each person brings in an Easter lily, my goodness, it will be so beautiful here on Easter Sunday. Um, and then Maundy Thursday, we will have a service here at 7 p.m. And um, it will be kind of a, a, a bit of a similar service to what you might experience in um, on Good Friday. We're going to kind of combine the two feelings of uh, Tenebrae and Maundy Thursday. And then on Good Friday, we get to get together with uh, many of the churches in our area and do a prayer walk and those details are on the screen but also um, on the flyer so we'll meet at 11 30 at I just blanked because it went away at United Methodist Church and the walk will be a mile long and then we'll conclude with a lunch together with our fellow um, churches in the area so it's a great opportunity to get to know some of the other um, faith communities here in Hillsboro and then finally, Easter Sunday, hallelujah. That's when we get to say hallelujah. We're not saying it up until then. Um, but Easter Sunday, we will gather together for brunch before worship, which I love that tradition. I am learning all the traditions as we go. And if you are able and willing, you're invited to bring a fruit or a pastry to share with everyone. And it will be somewhat of a potluck style um, offering before we come in and have our worship service together to celebrate the risen Christ. So um, that is Easter. If you are new with us or online, um, you can access the QR code on our website. We do uh, tithes and offerings now as a um, online only, or if you'd like to give your offering in the back, there is a little box in the back. That is specifically going to be important for this season that we are in. Um, we have a special offering that we do during this season, um, and that is one great hour of sharing. So what that is, is it's a Presbyterian Church USA-wide offering that we do during the season of Lent. And that offering, everything that's gathered for that offering goes to three different areas. One is disaster relief. So I was just in New Orleans. And PDA, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, did a lot of work to help them post Hurricane Katrina. So that's like one example of where that offering goes. And there are um, very active um, ones that they're giving to right now. So that's one of the areas. The other is hunger relief. And then the final is um, a development of people. So um, training education and um, ministering to people who are in need of additional support. So that's where that one great hour of sharing offering goes, and it's gathered over the course of the Lenten season. So there is an, a specific envelope that, um, that will have one great hour of sharing that you were handed when you walked in, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, I saw you handing them out. Um, and you can put that in the offering box. So, all right. Well, I am going to invite Pastor Phil, because I was away all week, Pastor Phil is going to be um, preaching for us this morning, and he's going to do our call to worship. So I invite you to stand for the call to worship. Jesus, light of the world, give us eyes to see as you see. 
Once we lived in darkness, but now, as children of the light, we are called to what is good and right and true. Jesus, light of the world, give us eyes to see as you see. You may be seated. The Dolans are coming up to share. A Lenten thought. Yeah. <laughs> So as we have been in the habit of doing over the course of the Lenten season, we are remembering that as the light grows for us, my goodness, it's so light today and I love it. Um, In our spring season, we know the light comes earlier and earlier each day. But in our church practice, in this ecumenical, in the church calendar, we know that we're kind of in the darkening of days where Jesus is about to be crucified. So we honor that and we pay attention to that as we do this extinguishing of candles. Um, And I'm realizing we have one extra candle lit, so I'm going to extinguish one before they get started because we only have one week left. Next week is the last candle for Palm Sunday. That will be the last candle and then all will be dark that holy week. So we pay attention to where we notice that darkening movement. So thanks, Dolan family. The scripture reading is from Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. remember the disciples' selfish desire for power and fame, John and James want to be greater than the other disciples. They want authority over over others, prominence, recognition, this kind of ambition, which is so valued in the world, has no place in the kingdom of God. Jesus challenges the disciples, reminding them that to drink from his cup and undergo his baptism is the way of the cross. Humility comes before glory. To become great, one must become a servant. Serving others is the co- at the core of Jesus' mission to give life as a ransom for ours. Pray with me. Jesus, we live in a world scratching and clawing for more authority and recognition. We confess we are temporarily, we are tempted by the false promises of ambition. We have let those lies seep into our lives together in this community. We confess we want the opposite of your mission. We don't want the cross. We want to be served rather than to serve. Change us, Jesus. Help us find the glory in serving one another. May we be a community that looks different than the rest of the world. Instead of being marked by ambition and jealousy, may we be known as a community that loves and serves. Give us the grace to, rep- to represent, to represent, so we may might seek you at first your good, true, and peaceful kingdom. Amen. Good morning, friends. 
God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I'm so glad I belong to this congregation and not one that would say, well, God's pretty good most of the time. <laughs> so let's stand and sing along with uh, the song, Trading My Sorrows. Presbyterians are allowed to cheer. <laughs> well, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, <coughs> so good. And that is the cry of our hearts. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We want to be changed. We want to be different. And you are the only one who can transform us. Yes, Lord. We invite you to make your change in us. Oh, God, why is it that we look and we do not see? Bring us again and again into your light until your ways become visible to us and bear fruit in us. Touch us so that we are changed, a before and an after, a now and a then, that we might also say, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's light, we pray. Amen. We'll stay standing for hymn 451, Open My Eyes That I May See. And pay attention as we go throughout this service. This is a service about seeing. So maybe the invitation can be this exact thing. Open my eyes, God, so I might see.
So we pray this prayer, open my eyes, open my ears, open my mouth. When our eyes are opened, we realize who we are in light of who God is, and that's why we move into a time of confession, because we realize that we need God, right? So we pray this prayer through song, and then we move into a time to actually spend some time confessing. So I want to invite you into a time of corporate prayer. So we will say this prayer together and then we'll move into some silence and just quietly in your own heart talk to God about what it is that you want to bring to him in confession. Let's pray. Wise and welcoming God, you are always seeking us out, yet we confess you are easily distracted from your presence. We envy those who are successful in the world's terms and pursue our own desires. We fail to question the cost of our desires to the earth or those in need. Forgive us, O oh God. Reawaken us to your purposes and reignite our commitment to pursue them for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the good news is that we do have a God of grace, a God who forgives and whose mercies are new every morning. And so we need to hear that out loud and we need to share it with one another out loud. So receive the good news. You are forgiven. You are set free. The things that we just brought before God are wiped away. So let's remind one another of that truth as we pass the peace on to one another. May the peace of Christ be with, let's, let's turn around and say this to them on, who are watching online, may the peace of Christ be with you. And then we say it to one another, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pass the peace to one another.
together. Breath of life, breathe on us. Open our eyes to see your presence in your word and in your world. Open our ears so that we might hear your voice calling us, calling us closer and closer to you. Soften our hearts so that we might respond to the invitation that you have for each one of us today. May it be so. Amen. Please be seated. So our first scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 23. And this week as I was preparing this, someone said, Psalm 23, that's always read at funerals. That might be true. It is a commonly read passage at funerals, but it's also a passage about the way that our God nourishes us, invites us into deep rest, pursues us, protects us, and deeply cares for us. So as we read this in light of a passage about blindness becoming sight, it's important to pay attention to the God who pursues us, the God who cares for us, and the God who nourishes us. So let's read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, sometimes that might mean blindness, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to invite Pastor Phil to come up. The last warning I had when I left the narthex back there was don't forget to turn off the microphone. So when we got to the end of the first song and I coughed my way through it, I realized I had forgotten to turn off my microphone. <laughs> I'm going to live. So will the people who heard me more than they needed to. Me, but Our scripture this morning is about sight, not hearing. But there's hearing in it. We'll go there too. We're reading from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to John. And we're reading in particular, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 6 through the 25th chapter. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, this word means sent. So the man went, and he washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had first formerly seen him begging and asked, Isn't this the man, the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he, he w was that man. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed 
And then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind, and now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe or keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned against the blind man. What have you to say about him? It is your eyes, it was your eyes he, that he opened. The man replied, He's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who, was, who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. This is the word of God. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, to come into your presence is always such a privilege, such an honor. We ask that you would guide and direct our discussion now, that the things that are said bring honor and glory and call us to further and greater worship for you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was just another day. Well, I guess that's not really true because it was actually a Sabbath, and the Sabbath was not really another day. It was a special day, a day that God had set aside back at the creation of the universe, back when he made heaven and earth. And at that point, he finished in six days and said, on the seventh day, I'm resting, and so I want you to rest from now on. And so that was a special practice that the Jewish people had continued through all of the years. Not when they were going away from God, but at least when they were serving God or trying to serve God. And they protected it in various ways so that you couldn't overdo on the Sabbath. But it was a day that Jesus, that we're looking at Jesus. And a day with Jesus is never really just another day. They're all unique in their own way. The latter part of John 8 tells us that Jesus was teaching in the temple at the time. He was in Jerusalem. And verse 12 of that 8th chapter said, he made the declaration, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That declaration warranted a response from the Pharisees, and the confrontation and interaction that resulted had the religious leaders picking up stones to throw at Jesus, and he was slipping out of, out of the temple. 
grounds. In the earlier verses of chapter 9, the blind man of our reading is identified as one who was born blind, which raised the question for the disciples, was it this man who sinned or his parents who sinned? The teaching, again, came from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, we know it as the Ten Commandments, in verses 9 and 10, God says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the question the disciples asked was not that unusual. But Jesus' response was, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. And he repeated again what he had said in chapter 8, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam. And then John adds, the word means sent. And it's interesting because other commentaries had made a note of the fact that that was a reference that John used to Jesus more than once throughout his gospel writings. Jesus was one who was sent by the Father. So the man was sent. So the man went and he washed and came home seeing. At this point, it would seem that the narrative centers around the man and what happened to him and how those events affected those around him. But I would contend with you that, like last week's message, was not really about the woman and her sin, but about the test and tempting that the Jewish leaders tempted on Jesus. This lesson is also really about Jesus and not so much about the man who was healed. For instance, the chapter opens with, as he went along, he saw a man from birth blind from birth. There was no indication that the man made any appeal or that he was drawing attention to himself. He was not like the blind Bartimaeus who shouted out, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Have me. And, and the crowds got back on Bartimaeus's back and said, you know, be quiet. We're trying to hear what Jesus is saying. And Bartimaeus, he wouldn't quit. Jesus, have mercy on me. Not this man. This man was helpless and hopeless. He lived in darkness. The other night, Peggy and I had finished watching TV and Peggy had slipped off to the, to the bedroom and I hit the light switch. And suddenly it was so dark in the living room I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Thankfully, I still had my hand on the switch and could turn the light on or I know I would have stubbed my toe or bashed my shin in some piece of furniture in the living room. But as it happened, I immediately thought of the blind man in our reading because I'd been thinking about him for the last three weeks anyway. His situation was not nearly as easily remedied. There was no switch. He constantly was in danger, danger of bumping into things or bumping into people of hurting himself. I find it difficult to even imagine what it would have been like or what it would be like to be blind from birth. What, what would it be like to not know that there are different colors, like all the green we see this morning, for instance? What would it be like to know that you could see a mountain in the distance and you could conjure in your mind how far away it was. This man couldn't do that. Or what it would be like to see the snow blanket the ground and get that picture again of what Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary did to wash our lives whiter than snow. 
This is the man Jesus stops beside. A man he didn't a- who didn't ask for help. A man who hadn't earned Jesus' attention by shouting or anything of that nature. But Jesus stopped. He spit on the ground, mixed it with the dust of the road, then smeared it on the man's eyes and told him to go rinse off in a pool in Siloam, someplace other than where they were. That in itself is rather remarkable. One, that this man let Jesus mix spit and dust, which he couldn't see happening, but wondered when he felt that muddy stuff go on his eyes, why did he let him do that? And second, that he would then head off by himself to a pool some distance away, all by himself. He didn't invite Jesus to go with him. At least John doesn't say that he did. In fact, we read that Jesus is no longer a part of that story, so to speak. Why this man? I know, I always ask questions. Why this manner of healing? Why this time? What's the message we're supposed to take home with us? Did it happen just the way we read it, or did the Holy Spirit for some reason inspire John to render the events in a slightly different way to make a specific point? Questions, questions, questions. According to events recorded here, after Jesus applied the muddy substance to the man's eyes, the story follows the man, and Jesus disappears from the scene. He doesn't disappear from the story, just the scene. What's fascinating to me is the reaction of the neighbors. I I mean, I understand the questions that they asked initially. Is this really the guy? I mean, we've seen him begging all this time. It doesn't look like him. Look at the countenance on his face, you know? No, it's not him. Until the man said, yep, it's me. Jesus made mud and put it in my eyes and told me to go wash at the pool of Siloam. And when I did, I could see. Why didn't the neighbors respond with, wow, that's fantastic. What's it like to be able to see after all these years and time? Or... What made Jesus stop and take notice of you? Or what made you trust him to put muddy dust and dirt in your eyes and then go all the way to the pool of Siloam? Did you expect to see when you washed the dirt off? Those are the kinds of things I would want to know. What's it like to see for the first time? Everything is old hat to me. I've seen everything so many times, it just doesn't even impact me. I've seen tall people and short people, skinny people and heavyset people. The way some people smile and other people seem to carry the the weight of the world on their shoulders. I seldom stop to smell the roses. I can walk by them and not even notice them. It must have been something fantastic when you came back from the pool and you actually could see those flowers that you used to smell but didn't know anything about. These are some of the things that I would want to ask the man. But the neighbors seemed more intent on knowing where Jesus went and how this transformation took place. But the man didn't know. And that seemed to have turned it into a matter for the religious community because it had happened on the Sabbath. So they took the man to the Pharisees. The first question the Pharisees asked was, how? How did you receive your sight? And the man told them the story. It was the same as I said before. He made mud of my eyes, and on, he put mud on my eyes, 
and I washed, and now I see. At this, there was a division among the Pharisees. Some didn't believe that Jesus could be a man of God if he didn't observe the Sabbath. And others said, how could a sinner give sight to a man born blind? So they asked the man who had been blind what he thought of Jesus. And he said, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. I have no idea how he came to that conclusion, but I suspect it had something to do with the miraculous event that had taken place in his own life. Not seeing for what, 20 years, 30? I don't know how old the man was, but suddenly to be able to see. It's interesting to me that they Pharisees gave this beggar the credibility of an answer to their question. And it stands to reason because the next text says that they questioned whether or not he'd actually ever been born blind. So they called his parents. The man's parents came and they asked him, confirm for us that this is indeed your son. And they said, it is. It is our son. He was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. One of the commentators pointed out that it's interesting because when the people responded, the parents responded, the Pharisees hadn't asked that question. They asked whether or not he was their son and whether or not he was born blind. But they didn't say anything about, you know, tell us how he got better. And yet the parents responded about that because, John says, they feared being cast out of the synagogue. That meant that they would be cut off from friends and family and community fellowship. And that was more than they could imagine. They left their son to fend for himself. The Pharisees went back to the man who'd been blind and said to him, give glory to God by telling the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. To which the man responded, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. These religious leaders were not done. They were determined to prove a hoax or Jesus a fraud. So they asked him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? That seems to have only resulted in what I'm going to call uh, a shouting match, a free for all, because now we have an opinionated former blind beggar and a group of religious leaders of the local synagogue that the passage said hurled insults at the man. And they threw him out of the synagogue. We've covered a lot of territory this morning, and there was Jesus with his disciples. Um, we covered a lot of territory this morning. There was Jesus and his disciples, the blind man, his neighbors, the Pharisees, and the religious leaders, and the parents. They all seem to have asked the wrong question at the beginning. The question, what? The disciples asked, what caused this man to be born blind? The neighbors asked, what do you know about this man? What happened to this blind beggar? Is it even the same person? The Pharisees wanted to know what happened and how. Even the parents acknowledged their son, but were unwilling to address the question of what had happened to make it possible for him to be able to see. Later, the religious leaders got around to asking the right questions. Who did this? And who is he? But they never got around to asking the question of why did it happen at all? 
What does God want us to take away from this time together? The fact that Jesus has compassion for this blind man is evident. Jesus reached out to this man who had a need. He'd been born blind. It wasn't his fault, the fault of his or the fault of his parents. It was one of those events that happen in life because of sin in our world. He didn't have to ask. He didn't have a reason to expect to have his needs met. He hadn't earned Jesus' attention. He didn't deserve Jesus' healing for his blindness. I heard a song on the radio this week that went, that had a line in it that went something like, it's not because I'm worthy, it's all because of mercy. This man, for this man, it was not because he was worthy, but because God had a task, a job, a, th a thing he wanted to do. Isn't his situation a lot like ours, like mine, like yours? Don't we have a need, a need to be forgiven? A need to have wrongs we've committed righted? Maybe we don't see it, blinded because we've gotten used to living this way for so long. Comfortable in the way that things have always been. But God sees it. He knows our blindness. And he's already met the need. That's what Jesus was saying in the early verses of this chapter. We must do the work of him who sent me. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And he began by giving light to a blind man. And by inference to the rest of us. He turned dust into mud and healed the blind man's eyes. I would suggest, think about it a moment, that he took the dust at the foot of the cross and turned it to mud with his blood that spilled from the soldier's spear while he hung on the cross. That's the compassion that Jesus showed when he went to the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, mine and yours. It's the same compassion the Holy Spirit showed when he opened my eyes to God's great love and invited me to accept God's gift of salvation. The same compassion that he showed to you when he opened your eyes to God's great love and invited you to accept God's gift of salvation or is willing to if you're willing to accept his invitation. It's the same compassion that enables us to see his handiwork in the world around us and recognize it for what it is. It's God at work. It's true that it was Jesus who opened the blind man's eyes, making it possible for him to see a natural world. But Jesus wasn't finished with the man or the lesson. The latter verses of this chapter tell us that Jesus found the man after he'd been thrown out of the synagogue. Listen to these verses because they're what wrap up the lesson that I believe God wants us to take home. He, that is Jesus, found the man and said to him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? This is the vital question, the specific question that, that demands an answer. <clears throat> it's the dust to sight question 
that is always answered with a yes or a no. Maybe is a no. Later is a no. I don't know is a no. It doesn't make any sense to me is a no. Yes, on the other hand, is an acknowledgement that sin has blinded us and that only Jesus can restore our spiritual sight and open our spiritual eyes. And once our spiritual eyes are opened, like the blind man in our story, we will worship our God who has redeemed us with the sacrifice of his only son. In the dust and the mud, be it spit or be it blood, God offers sight to the blind and hope for all eternity. Have you said yes? Will you worship with him with me? Let us pray. Lord, worship comes in a variety of forms, in praise and singing, in service, in study, in listening and observing. It also comes when we bow before you, when we recognize you for who you are, the creator and sustainer of the universe, and in Jesus, our Heavenly Father. We take this moment to recognize that through so many things, we just want to affirm again that we believe in your love and your sacrifice the sacrifice you paid at Calvary on our behalf. We know that we have a relationship with you because of that sacrifice. Thank you, Father. We believe in you. For Jesus' sake, amen. On your bulletin, it says we are going to move into a time of prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Um, we haven't done this before, but what I would like to do is allow your voices to be the prayers of the people. So what we're going to do is I will um, open us in prayer. And for those who are on your heart, you, the invitation is to simply say their name. So we're just going to pray for the people that are on our hearts, people that are in need of healing, um, heading into surgery, hungry, worried, anxious, depressed, any, any, any person that's come to mind or somebody that um, doesn't know Jesus and that you've been consistently praying for. So I will open us, I'll leave it open for a time for you to name the people and then I'll lead us into the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. God, we know that one of the responsibilities of your church is to hold your people and your world in prayer. So we come to you, and as we walked into this space, we carried into this room with us 
concern for people in our families, people in our places of work, neighbors, friends, pe people in our schools. So Lord, hear the names of the people that we are carrying as we hand them back to your care. Holy One, if you can turn dust into a living being, if you can turn dust into a source of healing, you can take what's in our hands, what's on our minds and weighing on our hearts, and bring beauty and healing and hope. So as we release what is in our hands and in our hearts and on our minds to you. And we acknowledge that there are some things we just don't have words for, some things we haven't named, some prayers we actually don't know how to pray. So we use the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, 187 from the Purple Hymnal, Shepherd Like. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
May the Lord, who can turn dust to sight, physical or spiritual, bless and keep you. May the light of his countenance shine on you and be gracious to you. And may you live in his peace, peace that passes understanding. Amen.